Hi there, my name is Estelle Trengove and this is the Phoebe 1000 Introduction to Electrical and Information Engineering. In this lecture, I'll start off by telling you what engineering is at a very high level and then I'll give you a high level view of what electrical and information engineering is. Next, we'll take a closer look at all the different fields that make up electrical and information engineering. Then I'll use a mobile phone network and also um, ATMs to um, give you an example of how broad electrical and information engineering is on the one hand and also how interwoven all the different parts are. Um, I'll finish up with examples of the types of projects that you'll do in information and electrical engineering and then I'll also give you a brief introduction to lightning which is one of the things that we study in the school of electrical and information engineering so what is it that engineers do they use their engineering knowledge and skills to conceive create design and plan components systems and processes and they solve problems of economic or social value. What is electrical and information engineering in particular? Well, electrical engineering is about the generation, transmission and storage and the use of electrical energy. So everything from where electrical en energy is generated at a coal-fired or a nuclear power station right up to the gadgets that use that electrical energy like lights and heaters and computers and um, anything you can think of that uses electrical energy. Information engineering on the other hand is about the processing, storage and transmission of information and both of those hang around a core of knowledge which forms the basis of the undergraduate program and leads on to postgraduate specialization. So that core of knowledge in the first year you'll be doing some introductory courses but you'll also get a solid grounding in physics, maths, mechanics and chemistry and then from second year onwards you will the maths and physics will start tapering off and you'll start to be introduced to um, engineering sciences in the various engineering courses. Electrical and information engineering is very broad. It includes very large things like a power station and very small things like a microchip. It also includes visible things like an electric motor or a cable and invisible things like radio waves or electromagnetic waves. One of the first sub parts of electrical and information engineering that I'm going to discuss with you is power engineering and power engineering is the classical heavy current engineering that involves the generation, transmission and utilization of electric power. We have courses in high voltage and uh, machines and you can see over here, these are the kinds of things that you will deal with in power engineering. A power station in this first picture, some electrical transmission lines in the second picture, and then also um, lightning, the study of lightning forms part of power engineering. 
the next subsection of electrical engineering that I'm going to talk about is control engineering. And control engineering is about designing intelligent devices that control systems. But I'd also, this picture that I've put in here that illustrates a control system shows us some important things that we do as engineers. The first thing is that we often simplify a system. So, for example, over here you can see there's a block that just simply says system. And all that, and we're not interested in the inner works, in workings of the system. So we're in, interested in what output we get. In this case, output Y for an input U. And we often do that as engineers. We like to simplify things. So if we don't need to know the inner workings of a system, then we don't show them. We just show the thing, the parts that we're interested in, which in this case is the input and the output. Where is control useful? Well, you can imagine that in chemical processes, for example, in nuclear reactors, where the temperature and the vibrations have to be controlled, it's very useful. In thermodynamic processes like climate control, in factory processes where you have to control um, conveyor belts and taps and uh, dis dispensing systems and packing systems control is very useful and also in aeronautical processes for example aircraft control if you think about um, when the pilot puts the airplane on autopilot then that's a very sophisticated control system working there to make sure that the plane keeps flying at the correct height and in the correct direction. We also have a strong biomedical engineering group in our School of Electrical and Information Engineering and biomedical engineering is the application of engineering and other disciplines to the analysis and solution of problems in medicine. So if you think about um, a CT scanner or a pacemaker, those are um, complex technological devices that form a biological function and that would have to be designed jointly by engineers and doctors. Software engineering is also part of electrical and information engineering and you can see some code in the background of this slide so you'll learn to do coding. Uh, by the time you leave the electrical and information engineering program you'll be a very good coder and many of our graduates go into jobs in software companies. Software engineers apply engineering principles to the development of computer and information systems. You might wonder why the world needs software engineers. The world needs software engineers because software is very expensive and the products are very complex and subject to constant change. If you think, for example, of the student registration system, the online system that we have at WITS, uh, that system costs many millions of rands to put in place and it still needs to be there are still some glitches and issues that need to be sorted out people in businesses all types of businesses are relying more and more on their computer systems so a bank for example if their computer system goes down then they can't operate and they have to close their doors until the computer system is back online again and software is often used in safety critical applications, for example, in hospitals and in aeroplanes. If you do electrical and information engineering, you'll also be doing some electromagnetics. And when I talk about electromagnetics, you should think about antennas. And electromagnetics is concerned primarily with sending and receiving radio waves and other electromagnetic waves and the effect of those waves on surrounding objects and electrical instruments. 
we see electromagnetics applications all around us. So, for example, um, every cell phone has a little antenna built into it. The round DSTV dish is an antenna. And if you look at the satellite, you can see this big brown thing on the side is a very big antenna. Um, and some academics at WITS also developed a computer simulation that does electromagnetic simulations, as you can see in this picture here. The school also has a strong research capability in the field of telecommunications. And if you do information engineering, you'll be doing some telecommunications courses as an undergraduate. Telecommunications is the technology that allows people and computers to communicate at a distance. And here we'll see our first example of both how broad the field of electrical engineering is and also how integrated. So over here you can see some cell phones with their little antennas sending a signal to the nearest cell phone tower. Each of these little hexagons is called a cell. That's why in South Africa we call those phones cell phones. The cell phone towers that are basically big antennas communicate with the radio controller network over here and that communicates with the backbone which is also computers and software. The signal is sent via a satellite um, back to the part of the network where it can be transmitted to the person that you're calling all the way back through the network again. So you can see that in this telecommunications, in the cell phone network, we make use of electromagnetics, of software, and of telecommunications, and also some hardware, of course. So everything is integrated and also very broad. An ATM where you draw money with a card is also a very complex electro electrical engineering project. So that your pin has to be encoded onto the magnetic strip in your card and when you put your card in into the ATM machine if you want to draw money that ATM machine has to communicate with your bank which involves telecommunications and also software and software systems to check whether you have money whether you're the correct person in the first place, whether you've entered the correct PIN, and then to check whether you have enough money in your bank account. And it then dispenses that money, it has to check whether you've um, exceeded your daily limit, and then it has to send a message to the bank again to say that you've received some money so that the bank can adjust the balance remaining in your account. So again, a very complex system that involves electronics, telecommunications and electromagnetics. You might have heard of Industry 4.0 and I'll show, explain to you briefly now what Industry 4.0 is and show you how Industry 4.0 is powered by the School of Electrical and Information Engineering at Wits University. The principles of Industry 4.0 are shown along this axis here. So Industry, industry 4.0 is going to be about interconnecting everything, so networks of sensors and and communication networks will connect everything to everything else. That's what we call the Internet of Things. So, for example, you might one day have a fridge that lets you know that you've run out of milk by sending you an SMS when it detects that the milk is finished. That would be an example of the Internet of Things. But even the smartwatches that many people wear these days is an example of the Internet of Things because your watch collects your heart, your heart rate and your heart rate 
is communicated to the health app on your phone. And if you're a member of Discovery Vitality, it sends that information to Discovery Vitality uh, so that you can get vitality points. The next principle of Industry 4.0 is information transparency, where the real world will have a digital twin, a, a model that mimics the real world in a digital way. And in that way, we'll be able to collect data and build a, a virtual world in the digital space. Another principle of Industry 4.0 is the principle of autonomous decision making. So for example, um, when a plane is put onto autopilot, that plane has to make a number of autonomous decisions. Um, people are talking about autonomous cars now that will be self-driving cars. The first step in that process was uh, cars with automatic gears where you don't have to manually change the gear but the car has the intelligence to to change the gears and these days you also get um, onboard computers that can monitor everything from your speed to your fuel usage and soon those cars are going to be able to make decisions on the road and drive without human intervention. And then the last part of, digit, of um, Industry 4.0 is robots, technical assistance. Um, so, for example, um, we won't have little humanoid robots running around making coffee for us, but even a software system that automatically directs your, your calls to the right place is a kind of digital assistance, a kind of robotic. So automated flight bookings, um, but also an arm in a factory, a, a robotic arm that takes Coca-Cola cans off a conveyor belt and puts them into a box. That's also an example of robotics. And then if you look along these axes, you can see all the places in the School of Electrical and Information Engineering where we engage with those aspects of Industry 4.0. I'd like to show you some examples of the kinds of things that you'll be able to do one day when you're a fourth year in the School of Electrical and Information Engineering. So here's an example of a fourth year project from a few years ago where Lauren and Wanda built the electronics that allow you to control the movements of a wheelchair with the sensors around your eye. So by moving your eye, you can move the wheelchair. In this project, Lauren and Vaz built a system. You can see the control system at the bottom over here. And there was a flat platform at the top with a little ball on it. The system could detect the position of the ball and it would correct the tilt of this platform so that even if you push the ball with your finger, the ball would never fall off. They also used this game controller to control the platform so that the ball would run, roll in a circle or even in a figure eight. So this was a really great project. Another one of last year's fourth year projects was Verushan and Kyle's project where they used a pair of inexpensive lab glasses and connected a webcam to it. And the webcam monitors the movements of your eyes and then they wrote some complex software that allows somebody who's paralyzed to control the mouse of the computer with the movement of their eyes. And these are the kinds of things that you'll be doing as an undergraduate. Last year, our first years built um, little airplanes made from recycled um, household materials that were powered by a little elastic band and we 
we tested them to see how far they could fly and we timed them until they crashed. The year before, the first year students built little DC motors that had to lift a five rand coin, uh, a height of one meter. These are the kinds of projects that you'll be doing later this year in design um, 1B. Last year, our third years used supercapacitors um, which are very big capacitors to power a torch, to build a torch. And over there you can see a torch shining brightly using a supercapacitor. I then handed out some resistors and students had to work out the value of that resistor. So the resistors that I handed out all had four bands. One of those bands was a um, the tolerance band and if you hold that tolerance band on the right hand side then you read the, the value of the resistor um, from left to right. So for example if you had a yellow, green, and orange, then the value, and this band was a gold band, then the value of this resistor would be the first um, digit would be yellow, so we can see here that is a four, so we would write a four. The second digit is green, so that's a five, so we would write five. And then we get to the multiplier, so it would be 45 times, and now we have orange, so we can see the multiplier, an orange multiplier is 10 to the three, so the value is 45 times 10 to the 3. And the tolerance, if the tolerance is a gold band, then it's plus or minus 5%. I finished off the lecture with a brief introduction to lightning. Um, we study lightning in South Africa because lightning still injures and kills many South Africans and it causes damage to power lines and to property. Some of the issues that are uh, specific to South Africa is that many people work outdoors in uh, um, agricultural activities, many uh, do sport outdoors, and then a large number of people live in informal dwellings that don't offer any protection against lightning. This is the world lightning map that was taken by NASA satellites. You can see over here, um, you can see North America, there's South America, here's Africa, and India, and Australia. And generally, as you move away from the equator, the amount of lightning decreases. So they've just taken it in the areas closer to the equator. And you can see this, these colors are where there's a high incidence of uh, lightning. And you can see, as one would expect, that there's a high incidence of lightning over here in Africa near the equator. That's where Uganda and the DRC are. Um, but then there's an oddity. As you, so as one would expect, as you move away from the equator, the amount of lightning decreases. But then here, as a result of a geographical oddity, there's a high amount of lightning in southern Africa. This is the map of South Africa. So you can see there's a high amount of lightning. The, the Drakensberg lies more or less over here. I'll draw it with a pen so that you can see it. It lies more or less here. Over here is Gauteng. So this is parts of KwaZulu-Natal. And you can see that there's a very high incidence of lightning over parts of Gauteng and parts of KwaZulu-Natal. The basic physics of lightning is relatively well understood. A lightning cloud is a very tall cloud 
um, that can be up to five kilo kilometers high. And as the thundercloud forms, ice, positively charged icy bits are separated from negatively charged water droplets. The clouds predominantly negative charge here at the bottom of the cloud starts to attract the buildup of positive charge on the earth so this is the earth and then as a, some of the negatively charged electrons start to move down towards the earth in a negative downward leader, a small positive upward leader forms on the earth. And it's when those two connect that you see a lightning flash. I'm going to conclude by talking about some of the ways in which people can be injured by lightning. So the first mechanism of lightning injury is a direct strike where a small upward leader forms from a person's head and that connects to the negative downward leader from the thundercloud and lightning strikes that person. You often hear people say that they've been struck by lightning, but it's more likely that they've been injured by one of the other mechanisms of lightning injury because a direct strike is almost sure to be deadly. Some of the other injury mechanisms of lightning, one of them is called a touch potential, and that's what happens when you touch something that is struck by lightning. So for example, if you're working with an electrical appliance and the electric cable near your house is struck by lightning, that charge can travel through the electric cable and through the implement that you're holding and give you a shock, for example, to your hand. There's also something that we call a side flash. So a side flash happens, for example, if you're standing under a tree and that tree is struck by lightning. The lightning current will always try to find the path of least resistance to the ground. So if it strikes something dry and it sees a human being standing there, it might jump across and find a path to earth through that human being because human beings are made, a large percentage of a human being is water and water is a very good conductor of electricity. The last two mechanisms of lightning injury are the step potential and the upward leader. The step potential occurs as something is struck by lightning and that lightning um, disperses in the ground. So if, for example, an animal is standing with its hind legs at a point of uh, high voltage and its front legs at a point of lower voltage, then that current might see the path through the nice moist cow as the path, path of least resistance and it, that can cause a cow's heart to fibrillate and the cow can die. And then the last mechanism of lightning injury is um, we talked about the little upward leader that forms on the earth. That little upward leader can also form from the top of a person's head. And even if that lightning flash connects to some other point, then sometimes that upward leader can be so strong that it can cause an injury to the person. And that is the end of my introduction to the School of Electrical and Information Engineering and to lightning.